Hello, my name is Avi and welcome to Maccabi Bushcraft. Here, we're going to be learning how to use a lensetic compass. So if you purchase a compass from us, or if you own a lensetic compass, and you want to remember how to use it, join us in these seven lessons as we go through map skills, navigation skills, both day and night, as well as using the compass and knowing all of the elements and components of the compass. I'll see you around. Let's learn about how this compass works. What are the different functions of the compass and what do each of these things represent and how they're to be used? First, let's learn about the bezel ring. The bezel ring is used to change the magnetic north and convert the compass to read grid north. Through the ability of, of moving each individual click clockwise or counterclockwise, each click represents three degree change per click. Next is the floating dial. As opposed to a water-based compass, which would become useless if a bubble is formed inside of the compass itself, this one uses a friction-based dial which floats upon a needle, and freely, which causes it to become freed from the elements and bubbles being formed as it's encased in a waterproof seal to protect its inside. Next is the luminous magnetic arrow which is used to show magnetic north and on top of it is a luminous line that is used for nighttime navigation. Next is the cover and base. This is used so that the compass can be stored away for later use. The thun loop is placed upon the end. This is so that you can easily glide your thumb and hold it into your hand when seeking to create an azimuth while looking through the actual sights. Next is the siding slot. The siding slot is used in combination with the siding wire. The siding wire is used to ensure the destination is facing the exact direction you are aiming to travel or locate degree wise. Next is the lens. The lens is a magnifying lens used to read the degrees on the compass when doing a thumb to cheek sighting position. This lens magnifies the actual degree dial inside the compass to see exactly the location you are aiming at, while at the same time you could place your eye upward looking through the sight wire to see the location you are focusing on. Next is the luminous sighting dots, degree reader, north west and east points on a compass. These luminous parts can either be a tritium base or phosphorescent. Tritium uses a radioactive substance which remains glowing with no need for external lighting and evening navigation, whereas the phosphorescent ones require an external light source for evening use to cause the glow to appear. These luminous sighting dots are for the use of nighttime navigating so that you can make an evening azimuth when using the sight aperture in order to make an accurate check on your sight designation and degree. The graduated straight edge was placed upon the compass so that if you had any maps that read 1 by 50,000, you can actually utilize the ruler in order to accurately measure distance on a map. When we're looking at the actual compass style area, we're going to find three things. One, we're going to find the fixed black index line, which shows me the exact reading of the degree I am facing when I am pointing the actual compass in the forward direction. The next thing is the red. The red indicates the degrees. This is all going to be found in five degree increments. And lastly, the mills. This is used to create a more accurate measurement of distance, but we're not going to get into that right now. Also to note is the sight aperture is magnetic. When you put it in the closed position, it will keep the dial from rotating so that it will stay from being moved about while in transit. When using a compass, we have to first learn that we are using what is called magnetic north as opposed to true north. This is because the magnet on the compass is pulled toward the northern magnetic field, which we have surrounding the actual Earth, which varies 
about a thousand kilometers in its location from what is called true north. Whereas on the top of the globe, in the ocean, because the magnetic field surrounds the Earth, making a north and south magnetic pole, each area on the Earth is affected to some degree when it comes to finding true north, as this can only be done through a mathematic conversion process using the declination, which we will discuss later. In order to create quadrants to map the earth so as to make travel on land and ocean simpler as to define where we are and where is our location and destination we're headed towards the earth was divided into two line types one which divides the north from the south and one which divides the east from the west the lines going from north to south are called meridians, which divide the Earth into degrees. The central point of these is called the prime meridian, which represents zero degrees and is used to represent distance from the north pole and from the south and zero out at the equator. The lines dividing the Earth lengthwise are called parallel lines, which wrap around the Earth to create quadrants so as to divide the map of the Earth into smaller areas, and is used to define distance lengthwise around the Earth and zero out also at the equator as well. Now, as for the maps are concerned today, we use what is called the UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator. The UTM system divides the Earth into 60 zones. Each of the 60 zone uses a transverse mercator and are divided by 20 latitude zones widthwise, each which are eight degrees in width. In each zone is a central meridian, which is an invisible line, which divides the coordinate box from east to west, so as to divide the box into a simpler north, south, east, west point. So if you live, for example, in Virginia, your grid coordinate would be zone 18S. In using this grid plan, it made it easier to plot and use as opposed to using a round grid plan, which is seen here, which used the curvature of the Earth. This map as seen was used to create even smaller maps in zone 18S and other zones, so as to have a more simpler ability to plot courses and based upon the need of detailed terrain of your location, you would choose which scale version you needed. For example, the more larger the scale is, the more less detailed the terrain features will be and also will cover a larger amount of ground and area. So for example, a 1 by 250,000 scale would mean that 1 inch equals 250,000 inches on the ground. Or a 1 in 100,000 scale would be 1 inch equals 100,000 inches on the ground as well as you go to lesser, one by 75,000, one by 50,000, one by 30,000, and of course the more basic one, one by 25,000. So therefore, the smaller the number, the greater amount of detail, the greater amount of information you're gonna have terrain-wise and feature-wise that you will see in your map, the larger the scale, the lesser the detail, and the lesser features you will see in your map. Now, since the maps most used today are smaller versions and more detailed than a simple main zone 18s map which covers a large area these maps have a more complexity issue to them but as we learn about them it will make using them simple the numbers on the side of the smaller maps represents the distance from the equator to the grid latitude position and is how grid wise north and south is defined while the numbers on the top of the map represent the distance to the center of the utm zone remember that invisible line we were talking about which means if i was using zone 18s there would be a more complex smaller group of grid maps covering the entire area of that part of virginia and the utm zone 18s would be divided by a single line called a central meridian so therefore the smaller maps would then tell me that from this position to the central meridian of 18s is how far this is located east or west of this actual dividing line of zone 18s therefore each smaller map group used to define the locations of a part of the whole entire area of zone 18s on the map will have a top section telling you how far east or west this map is located from 18s's central meridian 
Now the distance of 18S's section covers is a total of 1,000 kilometers being divided by two what's called the central meridian which we talked about earlier that invisible line that separates one part of the map so we can understand that the separation of 18s which separates one side from the other creating therefore an east and a west so this separation which i said is basically this invisible line used to create the east and the west on a map the west being the beginning of the zone of 18s and moving 500 kilometers toward the central meridian and east being from the central meridian which zeroes out and moves 500 kilometers east to the end of zone 18s therefore as we use the map here the number 717 which is located on the left hand side as seen is the location which is actually 217 kilometers to the east of the central meridian because it's measured crosses over the central meridian which is 217 kilometers if the number were lower than 500 kilometers it would mean the location is to the west of the central meridian therefore each smaller map section used to define the location of certain parts of zone 18s on the map will have a top section telling you how far east or west this map is located from zone 18s's central meridian now of course this could be any zone of any part of the map so when plotting a position on a map we first have to know some things about our map and in order to do this we have to know all the functions of how a map works so that we can understand how to utilize it properly here we're going to discuss these very things there's going to be a total of eight segments that we're going to focus on in regard to the map so we can understand how to read our map and know how the map is to be understood when actually looking at it and using it these seven sections are going to deal with one maps name the map name is the maps name after the most prominent cultural or geographic feature that is located on the map the number two spot is going to be the map location, which means this is the location of the map which you are focused upon in regard to the segment of the zone it covers. Number three is the declination diagram. The declination chart shows me the convergence I need to change magnetic north into grid north. The next one is the index boundaries. The index boundary shows me the position this chart is located and the surrounding charts which come past about it. In the fifth section here, we're going to be looking at the sheet series. This sheet series is the number used in reference for the map sheet that we are looking at. And number six is the scale. This is going to tell us the scale the map is utilizing. So therefore, we would be looking at what scale. Is it 1 to 500,000, 1 to 200,000, or 1 to 25,000, or so forth. In the seventh section, we're going to be looking at the bar scales. The bar scales used to convert map distance to ground distance. This means that we're going to be looking at this scale to show how far would be traveling based upon the measurements that is given to us in the bar scale in relationship to the map and the distance from one part to another part that you may be plotting. And lastly, number eight, the GMA, the grid magnetic angle. The angle that we see here in this chart of the declination chart is going to show me the angle difference that's in this specific area that I will need to use when transmitting my information from my compass in order to convert my magnetic north to properly convert it back to grid north. Now we're going to talk about color and description on a map. There's basically four colors, but we're going to separate this into five. That's because some older maps had different color usages as compared to the newer ones, which has been changed over. Let's look at this. What is the color black? The color black is always going to indicate man-made objects. So therefore, any kind of man-made object, bridges or a house or building or any kind of man-made structure this is always going to be indicated in black a blue always will indicate water sources rivers lakes streams 
This will always be the indication of water. The green will always indicate vegetation. Reddish brown indicates boundaries, major roads, elevation, or contour lines. Brown is, an, is the color used for elevation and contour lines, while red has been separated to make cultural features, populated areas, main roads, and boundaries. As you can see, the newer maps use a separation of brown and red, where the older maps used a reddish brown color for both of these together. Okay, so now let's dig a bit deeper into understanding what true north is and how we convert things from magnetic to grid. Because our maps are made with grid lines, these horizontal lines are to be used as grid north. Since our compass is going to point in the direction of magnetic north, we need to use the bezel ring on our lensatic compass to figure out the differentiations by utilizing the declination chart information to change magnetic north to be converted into grid north. In order to do this, we have to use the chart first and find out what the degree angle is, which is known as the GMA or grid magnetic angle, as found on the chart below the map. When looking at this chart, you will see that it says 19 degrees is the grid magnetic angle for this area. And you will also notice that the arrow for magnetic north points to the right. This would indicate and mean that in order for me to convert this over, to make it so that my grid north is being correctly used, I have to convert my magnetic north on my compass to read the grid north. And in doing so, I have to look at the degrees that's placed here. This angle is to be added to the compass in order to allow your compass to read grid north so as to orientate your compass with the map. Since the declination chart says 19 degrees, we have to turn our bezel ring clockwise, that is right, turn it to the right, six clicks. You must understand and know this. Why six clicks? This has to be understood. When utilizing a lensatic compass, every click represents three degrees. Therefore, for every six clicks multiplied by three, you're going to get a total of, that's right, 18. It's closest to 19, and this is exactly what we want. You always want to get the number closest to. So if it's below, you want to be closer to the below number. What I mean by this is, let's think about this. If I did seven clicks, I would now be at 21, three degrees in difference. However, 18 degrees, which is only six clicks, is only one degree difference. This is why you're always going to use the one that's closest to your number so that you can utilize the proper angle that you need to go at. When you want our compass to be close, we want to be as close as possible. This is why we're always going to use this. Now, what if your chart were to read it in the opposite direction? That means the magnetic north was going to be reading to the left. If the chart declination is facing the other direction, it's then you would have to add the six click counterclockwise on your compass in order to orientate it to the correct direction. And this is why. We always have to remember, whenever my magnetic north is facing towards the left, I need to turn it counterclockwise. Whenever my magnetic north is facing to the right, I need to turn it clockwise. And this will be how I will always have to utilize it in order properly to convert my magnetic north on my compass to read grid north. Because the magnetic field pulls in difference from east to west of America, so too is the declination differ. So as to compensate for this magnetic pull found in that area. So the simple rule of thumb is if the declination, remember again, is the direction that is clockwise, turn the bezel ring clockwise to orientate the compass. If, however, the declination is counterclockwise or to the left, turn the bezel ring counterclockwise or to the left to orientate the compass correctly. Once you have oriented your compass by using the bezel ring, turn the compass so that the arrow faces the new north orientation. You have now just oriented your compass to grid north. We'll see you next time as we learn in lesson number two, the grid.